speaking. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mark Crowther. I'm the chair of medicine at McMaster. I think everybody knows that. Welcome to uh, Grand Rounds, <coughs> Department of Medicine Grand Rounds at McMaster. Um, we've been trying a bit of an experiment over the last couple of weeks, and we've been co-hosting rounds with uh, other organizations, and it's been hugely successful today. Um, we're welcoming, I think it's the Canadian Hypertension Society and Dr. Stella Daskopoulou, um, who's going to co-host with me. Uh, uh, the speaker is uh, Dr. Ali Prebtani. I might just ask Dr. Daskopoulos if she could just give us a quick introduction of herself and also of the organization. And then at the end, I'll maybe ask for her to help to field the questions. So do you want to give us just a quick introduction of your organization and also um, kind of uh, how your mission about uh, hypertension? Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Stella Daskopoulos, a clinician scientist at McGill University. I have been involved with uh, Hypertension Canada, the old JEP, since 2010, and I'm honored to serve as um, the chair of the um, Central Review Committee and the co-chair of the guidelines for the past five years. And uh, together with uh, my, my, my partner in crime, uh, Dr. Uh, Rabi, Doreen Rabi. Uh, so we are very proud of our process. We have a very rigorous methodology, uh, as you probably know, in the Hypertension Canada Guidelines Committee that gave us the international recognition. And we are probably the only guidelines committee that it's, uh, creates uh, evidence-based uh, guidelines as opposed to other organizations that create evidence-informed guidelines. So uh, we moved uh, last, uh, last time, we moved to a two year cycle to allow for implementation, greater implementation and uptake. We have reorganized our, our guidelines committees to thematic sections and um, our paper, our main uh, guidelines uh, paper is out hot off the press this month, has been published in um, the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. It's free, you can download it and access it and download it and uh, uh, you can see that we have organized it into key thematic uh, sections, key messages to allow for greater implementation. So um, uh, we also looked at all guidelines, we removed redundancies, so we have a pretty new and uh, more readable uh, document. So our mission uh, so far is accomplished. <laughs> in other words, we have probably the greatest uh, control in hypertension in the world. Um, the latest we have is about 65% of people who, with hypertension uh, um, have been, uh, are, are, uh, are controlled, and uh, as opposed to other countries that uh, are as low as 36%. So we want to continue. Uh, we are in, on, on track, but uh, we're not there yet. We're not in the 19%. So this is uh, our mission to uh, improve even further, increase awareness, and uh, uh, bring, you know, like the guidelines more to uh, closer to the stakeholders, uh, uh, physicians, and then to the to the public. So, um, we are, um, Ali, I've been known him for a long time. He has made invaluable contributions. We're very lucky to have him and benefit from his knowledge and dedication. And uh, I don't want to take more time. Uh, I can answer questions if you have for me at the end. So, thank you so much. Thanks very much. That's great. And we'll you know, hope that we'll have further involvement in the future. So the speaker for today is Ali Prebtani. Everybody from McMaster knows Ali. Ali's been around for not quite as long as I have been, but he's been around for a long time. <clears throat> he's a professor of medicine, at, at, was a long-term and founding, really, endocrine program director at McMaster, uh, and uh, has done a tremendous amount of great work through his international outreach work, particularly um, helping to keep the uh, resident exchange programs running very efficiently, making it one of the most highly desired resident experiences at McMaster. And Ali has done a lot of work in hypertension over the years and is going to present today on hypertension, what is new and old. So Ali, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I hope you can hear me okay. Yep, fine. So just, I uh, was told to put this code up and for those who are on the phone, it's for the attendance. It's C for cat, H for Harry, 8047, and that can be mailed to Gail Campbell. These are my conflicts of interest, uh, all nonprofit, in particular with Hypertension Canada. So I'm going to try to make today's uh, discussion uh, practical, evidence-based as much as we have, and some takeaway key points. There's a lot of uh, things that are in the guidelines, as uh, Dr. Descoplos uh, probably said, but obviously that would take days to cover since we actually take months to cover them but I thought I'd focus on what's really new in 2019 and 2020. Also what's old, but what's really important that we need to reemphasize, what's the evidence. And at the end of the day, what do you do for the patient in front of you? 
And lastly, we can't get away with any topic if we don't talk about coronavirus 2 or COVID-19. And I'll talk about some of the data and what the practical recommendations are for the RAS blocking agents and COVID-19 uh, risk. So Dr. Descoupel has already mentioned this, Canada does have the world's highest blood pressure control rates. Just another reason for us to be proud of our country. And it's been a real honor to work with people like Stella and Doreen and Ernesto and Raj and uh, Nadia Khan from Hypertension Canada. It is a non-profit orga organization. We don't get any payment for this. We really do a rigorous process in terms of assessing uh, the data and the guidelines. And it's quite peer reviewed and with a, with a very strong uh, central review committee. And there's a whole lot of uh, patient and uh, public uh, in, in, uh, dissemination also that goes through this. So, you know, this is a really important slide. We all worry about many, many things in medicine that have an effect on uh, death and morbidity worldwide. But if you can look at this, this is from 2000. High blood pressure or hypertension has the greatest proportion of deaths attributable to a risk factor worldwide. Shocking. And this is both in the East and the West. Obviously, if you go to the East and the developing world, then you get into infections and so on. But hypertension has a lot to do with respect to death and mortality and morbidity. And the good news is there's a lot we can do with it with simple, effective lifestyle and pharmacological measures, which I'll get into. So why do we worry about blood pressure? At the end of the day, there's many, many things. There's MI, there's atrial fibrillation, but the biggest bang for the buck, and we all don't want, is a stroke. As if you can look, even a small reduction in blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, can result in a significant reduction in stroke, up to 35 to 40%. And this is unbelievable. Many, many, many therapies don't achieve this reduction, both absolute and relative risk. But also important is coronary heart disease, MI, heart failure. I can go on and on and on, right? There's chronic kidney disease and so on, but stroke is the biggest bang for the buck. But if we measure blood pressure, this is really important. It's gotta be done the right way. If it's not done the right way, you're going to either overdiagnose, underdiagnose, and that's really important in terms of implication, cost, uh, patient harm, and safety. So this is a little. It's available from Hypertension Canada. It's quite simple. It goes to how to measure blood pressure. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail because of time, but I put this in every single office at the McMaster Boris site and at the at the OPD at the Hamilton General. So when house staff come in, they actually are really doing it properly. So we serve justice to the patient in front of us because we do see a lot of hypertension. So the first point I wanted to talk about is how are we now diagnosing and monitoring blood pressure? We used to use the sphingometer, and we know that that is highly inaccurate based on technique and the machine and actual the meter, which might be old and not functioning. So we really gone away from in office, in front of the healthcare provider, diagnosing blood pressure to out of office blood pressure measurements. And this helps us with many, many things. It makes an accurate diagnosis of hypertension. It also rules out white coat hypertension or rules it in and also talks about also a diagnosis, mass hypertension, which I'll get into in a bit. There's a few ways to do out of office blood pressure measurements. We can do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring where you have a device hooked up for 24 hours. And this has a much greater predictive ability than OBPM, which is office blood pressure monitoring for events, which I'll get into in a bit. Then there's also home blood pressure monitoring, which is where you can get a calibrated approved device by Hypertension Canada at Costco, shoppers, wherever. And this also has a greater predictive ability for events uh, based, uh, compared to office blood pressure monitoring. So just about what is mass hypertension? We all know what normal tension is. We all know what true hypertension is. We all know what white coat hypertension is. But just to summarize, white coat hypertension is when you go to the healthcare provider, your blood pressure is high, but you come home and it's totally normal. Mass hypertension is a relatively new phenomenon. This is when your blood pressure is normal at the healthcare provider's office, but when you go home, it's high. Interesting. The mortality, the morbidity with mass hypertension is much higher, but the, what we don't know, and there are trials going on in our own group, is to see if we treat mass hypertension, do we offer any benefit to the patient? So hopefully in the next year, next few years, we will get that answer. But as you can see here, based on this study, mass hypertension had a significant increase in CV events compared to normal white coat and even uncontrolled office blood pressure elevation or true hypertension. So just some data on correlation with out-of-office BP versus office BP, which is done in front of the healthcare provider. As you can see, both for systolic and diastolic blood pressure elevations, home blood pressure monitoring and 24-hour ABPM or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring have a greater correlation to left ventricular hypertrophy and urine albumin excretion ratio, urine albumin excretion ratio which we both know are very strong predictors as surrogate markers for outcomes in cardiovascular disease. Now, is there a value to doing office blood pressure monitoring? Well, there is if it's done properly. That's why we put the A in front of the OBP. If it's done automated, 
using oscillometric devices. So automated office blood pressure devices do have somewhat of a similarity to, to outcomes with out of office blood pressure monitoring if it's done properly. The healthcare provider is outside the office and there, the other key point is multiple readings are done with an approved functioning validated device. And there is similarities to LVH for urine albumin to creatinine ratio and also for carotid intimal media thickness. So this is, I'm not gonna go through this diagram, but this is, you can get this from our, uh, from the guidelines. Basically, this is the new diagnostic algorithm from 2020, how to make the diagnosis and approach to hypertension in the current age. The key questions here to ask is, what is the blood pressure? Where was it done? Do the patient, does the patient have diabetes? And how many readings are done? And do we need to go on to do out of office blood pressure monitoring to make the diagnosis? The key points are, is if the blood pressure is really, really high, above 180 over 110, even in the office, the per, per patient probably has hypertension, even if you do it at home. If it's less than that, and the patient doesn't have diabetes, then you should probably be doing out of office or automated office blood pressure monitoring to make the true diagnosis of hypertension. And the key numbers to remember in a non-diabetic, moderate risk patient is daytime blood pressure diagnosis is more than 135 over 85, and 24 hour mean of more than 130 over 80, similar to the diabetic population. So everyone's probably heard of the sprint. So this is where the old, little bit of old is still important because it hasn't been taken up as much as we would have liked. Um, this was a large randomized control trial where we looked at patients should have a target of less than 120 versus 130, which was the initiation of blood pressure intervention in this randomized control trial. But this was for high risk patients. They had to all be over 50, and the blood pressure start had to be more than 130 millimeters mercury systolic. Diastolic was not studied. And they had to have clinical or subclinical CVD, chronic kidney disease, as per the definition on the slide, and their estimated global 10-year risk more than 15% based on Framingham. Or they had to be more than 75 years old. What did this show? There were multiple outcomes, but the primary outcome was a composite of acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, stroke, and cardiovascular death there was a significant reduction over five years in the composite outcome, as you can see. And the number needed to treat was around 61. And this trial actually had around nine, over 9,000 patients. So this is a summary of number needed to treat and absolute risk reduction. As you can see, the primary outcome, the NNT was 61, and the risk reduction absolute was minus 1.6%. But there were some harms also. So it's not for everyone but it's for the high risk patient who can tolerate this therapy. But overall, the benefit exceeded the risk in the right patient. Most of the harms were reversible and did not lead to mortality or significant morbidity. The key thing to remember, there's a few things on this slide, is this, the patient population in the sprint did not, did not include patients with diabetes or prior stroke. So these patients were not included. So we have to be careful in extrapolating this to patients with diabetes and prior stroke. A few other things is obviously if they have orthostatic hypotension and you couldn't do blood pressure properly, this was not validated. The other key point here is all the patients in SPRINT that were enrolled had to have blood pressures done by AOBP. It was automated blood pressure monitoring outside where the, where the healthcare provider was outside the patient's room with multiple readings. So that's important also. So based on that, we added an extra guide, extra row, that for high-risk patients based on SPRINT, the target should be less than 120 if their blood pressure systolic is above 130. That is the target if the patient is a candidate based on the SPRINT criteria. And the diabetes, moderate to high risk, and the low risk targets in initiation therapy have remained the same. So next question is, we use a lot of diuretics. And here I'm going to refer to thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics, not loop diuretics, such as furosemide. We're talking about indipamide, chlorothaladone, hydrochlorothiazide, and so on. Does it matter which type of diuretic you use? Where there is a large metanalysis, we showed it does. So both types of diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, which is a thiazide, and thiazide-like, which are indipamide and indipamide, both types reduce CV events, stroke, and heart failure. But only the long-acting thiazide-like diuretics, indipamide and chlorothaladone, actually reduce all-cause mortality and coronary events. So it does matter what type of diuretic you use. And this is just showing also a reduction in blood pressure. Based on the data that we have, chlorothaladone has a far greater reduction in blood pressure 
compared to hydrochlorothiazide. Like, and that might be just to the mechanism of action and also to the, to the duration of the action of the chlorothalbone, which is much longer acting than hydrochlorothiazide, like, which is quite short acting. And we know this is important because even small reductions in blood pressure, one to two millimeters mercury if done properly, can, can have significant impacts on outcomes. So what about resistant and refractory hypertension? We see many, many people, we have them on multiple agents, still we're not getting them at target. So what is the definition? That's the first thing you have to ask yourself. So resistant or refractory, which can be used interchangeably in terms of hypertension, is patients who are at blood pressure above target. How do we define that? If they're on more than or equal to three drugs, they're on optimal doses, the blood pressure technique is optimal, and they should at least be on a thiazide or a thiazide-like diuretic and even usually a RAS blocker, such as an ACE or an ARB, or a dihydropyridine long-acting calcium channel blocker. Before making this diagnosis of refractory or resistant hypertension, we must rule out non-adherence, because non-adherence, as we know in chronic disease, is not uncommon. We must rule out white coat. That's where out-of-office blood pressure monitoring is important. And also, we must rule out common causes of secondary hypertension, which is another whole talk. And the other key thing is I do have a slide on this, but often we forget to ask about things that are not prescribed, patches, puffers, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, COX-2 inhibitor, inhibitors, excessive alcohol intake, birth control pill, and so on. And these days people are taking a lot of herbal stuff and supplement stuff, and you'd be surprised and shocked how many cases we've seen where we've, we've just asked them to stop these things and their blood pressure comes back to total normal. So this was a randomized control trial done a few years ago. Again, important, back in 2015 which compared in patients with refractory or resistant hypertension spironolactone on top of usual therapy, which is A for ACE or ARB, C for calcium channel blocker, D for diuretic, and compared spironolactone add-on versus placebo versus bisoprol or doxazosin. The bottom line is, is this was about roughly about uh, 500 people were screened and about 300 were actually enrolled, showed that overall spironolactone had a much greater, greater reduction in blood pressure both systolic and diastolic, and also a greater reduction in uh, home and uh, office blood pressure recordings. And even though these were, this was a positive study, we don't have actual clinical outcome data, but we, just, we do know that blood pressure reduction does lead to improved cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And interesting, why, what is the biological thought why this happens, why this is important? There may be patients who are chronically stressed it may be more responsive to ACTH, which can have an, have an effect on aldosterone secretion. And there also may be a gene mutation in this gona glomerulosa, where aldosterone is uh, synthesized and it's more uh, prone to ACTH stimulation, even under normal conditions. Now, some people cannot tolerate spironolactone, but in the guidelines, we also have evidence that if they cannot tolerate spironolactone or if they have contraindications to spironolactone for refractory, or resistant hypertension, it is not unreasonable then to add a beta blocker, especially a selective beta blocker, such as bisoprolol, a central alpha agonist, such as clonidine, and also other drugs, such as alpha blockers, alpha-1 blockers, such as doxazosin. So what about adherence? How do we promote adherence and better blood pressure control? The concept of, concept of single pill combinations is present in many, many chronic diseases. Osteoporosis, diabetes is classic, and hypertension. We do know that for chronic diseases, combining two doses in lower doses has a greater efficacy with less side effects rather than maximizing one therapy. And the same is for hypertension. We have several studies showing that for hypertension using single pill combinations of different antihypertensive agents with different mechanisms of actions, we improve adherence and we improve blood pressure control and likely reduce CV events versus monotherapy. So that's why in this slide, actually, we put down from the guidelines an addition for a box of single pill combination, especially if their blood pressure is significantly out of target, in addition to health behavior management. Another key point that I wanted to mention is most of us already know this, but it is important not to combine ACE inhibitors and ARBs because of the harm based on the on-target study and other smaller studies that we have uh, noticed in the last few years. So what about acute intracerebral hemorrhage and blood pressure management? Medicine, at least at the general, we see a fair bit of intracranial hemorrhages, although many of them may go to neurosurgery and many of them may go to ICU, but there are ones that are non-operable that come to general internal medicine. Up till a few years ago, we weren't really sure. There was no conclusive evidence. How quickly 
and how low should we drop the blood pressure in patients with acute ICH or intracranial hemorrhage or acute intracranial hemorrhage? Well, we had two studies in the last few years, large randomized control trials, Interact2 and ATTACH or ATTACH2, showing that in over 3,000 patients separately, that we can go down to 140 without significant harm, but going lower than that, there's no additional benefit in terms of recovery, discharge, mortality, morbidity, but it may even cause harm. So based on these two studies, the recommendations are for acute hemorrhagic stroke, if the blood pressure systolic is between 150 to 220, and there's no contraindications to acute lowering of blood pressure, lowering down to 140 is safe and effective, but going below that is probably gonna harm and cause no additional benefit. Another caveat is if their blood pressure is significantly elevated above 220 systolic, then they may need more aggressive reduction using intravenous medications and more frequent blood pressure monitoring, at least in the step-down unit, if not in the ICU. So my favorite, what about primary aldosteronism? Probably the most common, one of the most common causes of true bill, refractory, and secondary hypertension. A paper just came out three days ago from the annual showing that this is even more common than what I'm showing on this slide. But due to time limitations, I didn't actually include it. But the message is the same. If you look at, if you look at primary care and in tertiary care, the prevalence of hyperaldosteronism is very, very high. And a lot of these cases are being missed. Therapy is being used, which may not be effective, where if you intervene for this condition with simple measures, whether it's medical therapy or surgical therapy, if appropriate, we can get significant reduction in blood pressure control without causing harm and causing and, and, and improving patient blood pressure control and hopefully outcomes. Independent, in terms of comparing with essential hypertension, if you look at hyperaldo, primary hyperaldosteronism versus essential hypertension, there is an increased risk of complications with hyperaldo versus essential hypertension, in particular stroke and other cardiovascular events, but also with sleep apnea, interestingly, and chronic kidney disease. And there are some small data showing that patients with hyperaldosteronism versus essential hypertension have more higher risks of anxiety and depression. But this, is, this needs to be further elucidated. So should everyone get tested for hyperaldosteronism? I would say no, but many more should be getting tested than they are at present. Patients with refractory hypertension, as I've already mentioned, patients with hypokalemia and easily provoked hypokalemia, and just keep in mind, up to 60% of patients with primary hyperaldosteronism are actually normal kalemic. Another clue is in someone who has refractory hypertension, they're on an ACE or an ARB. They're also on a beta blocker, but their potassium is 3.5. They're still not hypokalemic, but despite using agents which should cause hypo hyperkalemia or relative hyperkalemia, they're still low normal potassium. And the last one where they scream is also someone who has an adrenal mass detected incidentally on imaging for hypertension or with hypertension. It's actually quite easy to do. I would not recommend doing it in everyone in the inpatient because there are certain criteria that need to be used. They have to have normal potassium levels. Their kidney function needs to be real normal. And there are a lot of interfering medications. But the bottom line is, if you suspect this condition, especially if they're refractory based on the above, above points, <clears throat> ideally speaking, ideally, they should be off their spironolactone for at least four to six weeks time. Their potassium should be normal. They should have adequate salt intake for that time. And if they are hypokalemic, they should be replaced. And at that time, once you meet all these conditions, just measure their aldosterone and their renin at 10 in the morning, along with their creatinine and their potassium. Fasting is not required. And what we're using in our lab at the general and many, many labs across Ontario now is we're still using aldosterone and picomol per liter, but most of our labs have gone to renin concentration versus renin activity. Renin activity was used in the past, but it's much more arduous and more difficult to get. So we're using renin concentration and nanogram per liter. And the numbers to really remember, if the ratio is more than 144, it's very strongly suggestive and based on the aldosterone renin ratio of hyperaldosteronism. But many of these patients still need to go on to confirmatory testing. If it's less than 100, it's probably unlikely, as long as it's done carefully. But keep in mind, many of these drugs, if you don't take them off, they can go a false negative, especially calcium channel blockers, um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs can all, all give false negatives. But the key thing is many more people need to be tested so we can actually uh, case detect uh, patients for primary aldosteronism. <clears throat> so are drugs this important? Well, we need much more than that. 
there is data showing that health behaviors have a significant impact on patient uh, self-promotion and blood pressure reduction and hopefully outcomes. The biggest bang for that probably is the DASH diet, which is the classic Mediterranean diet, low fat, low milk, lots of fruits and vegetables and grains. As you can see, just with this diet alone, there's 11, 11 millimeter mercury reduction in systolic BP and up to six millimeter mercury reduction in diastolic blood pressure. So please let's not forget lifestyle also, in addition to pharmacological therapy. They work in hand in hand and they're probably synergistic. I've already talked about other interfering substances that can aggravate blood pressure, but keep in mind, we always must ask about alcohol besides its other deleterious effects. Non-steroidals are notorious. The problem with these drugs, such as naproxen and ibuprofen is they can be purchased over the counter now. So patients won't tell you about them unless you ask them. And many, many people have pain and they will use them without letting the healthcare provider know. In young women, birth control pills can have a significant impact on blood pressure, corticosteroids. And I've already mentioned herbal products and supplements. Please ask about these. You'd be surprised when you read the table of uh, the ingredients, what's in these things such as uh, steroids and so on. I can go on and on and on. And in the cancer th um, therapeutic area, many of these therapies also cause uh, hypertension, in particular, multi-kinase or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as seranafib and sinitimib and so on. So this is a nice quote by Sir William Osler, and it's so true, especially with refractory and, and resistant hypertension, and if you don't ask about herbal medications. The young physician starts life with 20 drugs for each disease, and the old physician ends life with one drug for 20 diseases. This also applies to the polypill combination concept also. So true. So last but not least, as I mentioned, we can't go out without a talk about COVID-19. So based on the earlier reports, in particular in China, when this all started with COVID-19, there was a thought that patients on ACE inhibitors and ARBs had a higher risk of COVID-19 infection and worse outcomes with COVID-19 infection. But this was not based on any strong data. And the feeling later on was that was, the risk was probably based on uh, other comorbidities, such as hypertension and smoking and diabetes and immunocompromised status. Anyways, the theory here is that if you have someone on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, such as an angiotensin receptor blocker, there's a theoretical risk of upregulation of the ACE2 receptor, the ACE2 receptor, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is very important for a viral entry, for COVID-19 entry. But again, this is theoretical and has not been borne out in, in, in many, many patient studies. Uh, and even in uh, certain animal studies, it's not totally borne out. So this is all theoretical. Uh, and this is where the speculation or the thought of biological plausibility, plausibility came into effect. So what does the data say? <clears throat> so there was a large systematic review done recently. And this included uh, three large uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, also observational studies looking if ACE inhibitors and ARBs actually do have a significant impact, either negative or positive, on, uh, on COVID-19 infection, COVID infection uh, severity of infection, and outcomes. So in this systematic review, there were two retrospective cohort studies. There was one case control study, and there were 14 observational studies, up to 24,000 patients globally. Most of these studies uh, looked at patients from China, Italy, and New York. The bottom line is, is there were consistent messages. There was no increased risk of COVID-19 infection. There was no association with the illness in a large community. And there was no increased risk of severe illness or outcomes based on this meta-analysis and these studies. Keep in mind, there were some limitations, but the message was consistent. Many of these studies were small and were not adjusted for confounding variables. But the key point again is the message was consistent. In fact, some of these studies, the observational studies, showed benefit with patients being on ACE or ARBs. Interesting. So maybe one more indication in addition to the previous ones for RAS blocking agents. Currently, globally, there are several randomized control trials to see if these agents are beneficial. Four big ones are in process right now, and many of them have started enrollment. And they're looking at nebulized captopril, losartan, and other ACE inhibitors. Another interesting that I just read a few days ago, which uh, again, based on observational data, showed that in patients who were using spironolactone had better outcomes with COVID-19, interestingly. And the thought here is, is that spironolactone, which is a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, also blocks androgens. 
and androgen is required as a permissive factor for viral entry of COVID-19 via the ACE2 receptor. So again, there are some studies also going on looking at the introduction of spironolactone to see if spironolactone can also reduce outcomes with COVID-19 and the risk of infection. So all in all, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, spironolactone are all under the class of RAS blocking agents. So the bottom line, with ACE, ARBs, and the RAS blocking agents and COVID-19, based on evidence in the societies across the world that look at hypertension, is there is no hard evidence that ACE, ARBs, increase the risk of COVID-19 infection or severity. In fact, they may even be beneficial, but that is to be seen in future studies. So the bottom line right now is to continue these medications for their compelling indications, unless there's a reason to stop them, such as hyperkalemia, significant hypertension, or acute kidney injury, requiring dialysis or not. So this is just a slide that I put up. As we know, there are multiple indications for ACE inhibitors and ARBs, wonderful therapies with amazing evidence in large randomized controlled trials in the heart area, in the kidney area, and maybe now for COVID-19, we will see. So what are the key take home messages? I'm almost done here. We're moving away from in office diagnosis and monitoring of blood pressure. We should be focusing on out of office monitoring, including ABPM or home blood pressure monitoring. And if done properly, automated office blood pressure monitoring because there are greater correlations with outcomes versus office blood pressure monitoring the way we've been doing it in the past. We talked a little bit about mass hypertension, how the mortality and morbidity is higher. But what we don't know yet is if we intervene, do we make any improvements in outcomes? That is to be seen. Thiazide like diuretics have greater efficacy and blood pressure control compared to hydrochlorothiazide, which is a thiazide diuretic. And using single pill combinations for both blood pressure control, outcome reduction, and adherence, especially once daily forms, which we have many of right now. <clears throat> Having a low threshold for using drugs such as spironolactone, which is a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, especially for refractory hypertension, since the reduction of blood pressure is quite significant compared to other standardized add-on agents after standardized therapy. And for high-risk patients, if they meet SPRINT criteria, consider a target blood pressure systolic less than 120. And please don't forget primary aldosteronism, which is a very common cause of secondary hypertension, easily treatable and easily diagnosed if done in the right conditions. We also talked about acute intracranial hemorrhage and the new blood pressure targets. And we can go down to 140 without causing significant harm acutely, but going lower than 140 offers no additional benefit systolic and may even cause harm. And last but not least, with our full COVID-19, RAS blockade is safe and may even be beneficial. Again, just a plug for Hypertension Canada, our nonprofit organization. I encourage all of you to actually Google hypertension.ca. Lots of free tools for both patients and healthcare providers, downloadable things, and you will find it very helpful. And we've actually redesigned the site, which is easily navigable, nav, easily, easy to navigate, and you'll find lots of important, valuable information. We will all get through this. We will all get through this with our full COVID-19. Once again, the code is C for cat, H for Harry, 8047, to be emailed to Gail. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Ali. That was spectacular. Um, I'll see if Dr. Daskopoulou can unmute herself. She should be able to, I hope so. Uh, and while we're yeah. just waiting for that, yep, there she is. Good. Uh, just very quickly, Ali, as, as I've told you, um, uh, I have really bad hypertension and, and uh, I must say that I would strongly endorse your chlorothaladone over hydrochlorothiazide for lots of different reasons. And uh, chlorothaladone to me had a much better long-lasting therapeutic effect. I think that's the other thing. The half-life of hydrochlorothiazide is so short that when you wake up the next morning, you've got your hypertension back, whereas with chlorothaladone, it seems to really help a lot. And I'm glad to hear that I can continue taking my herb. Um, Dr. Daskopoulou, do you want to moderate some questions or do you yeah. want me to? Yeah, as you wish. I'm happy okay. to do this. Okay, so, um, so we'll move to the first question. So how should the intensive blood pressure intervention in SPRINT be applied to elderly more than 75 years old? That's a really good question again, Stella. Once again, we really need to apply the criteria. The blood pressure has to be diagnosed by automated office blood pressure monitoring, several readings, and the initiation should be above 130 systolic. And in the elderly, the other big concern is orthostatic hypotension. So before starting aggressive therapy in the elderly, we must be really sure that we do orthostatic vitals and the patients are aware 
how to monitor for orthostatic hypotension and to watch for orthostatic hypotension. When I do initiate aggressive therapy for the elderly, I, all, I get them all to buy a validated blood pressure monitor and actually to do periodically their orthostatic vitals at home to make sure we're not running into trouble. So we have to be a little bit careful in the elderly, but they do benefit if they are high risk and they're not diabetic and they haven't had a previous stroke. And uh, if I may add to that, uh, may I? Sorry. Sure, absolutely, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so in fact, uh, there was a subgroup uh, analysis uh, in the Sprint and people over the age of 75 did even better than people less than 75. But uh, as Ali said, we have to be very careful. It has to be people who are not, who do not have a uh, hypotension or, um, you know, like other contraindications. So for the right patient, actually, it's actually more beneficial, beneficial for, uh, for the elderly. Also, there was an, another side um, study of SPRINT, the MIND uh, SPRINT, that looked at dementia in older people and even uh, decreasing blood pressure to 120 um, I, I actually was more beneficial uh, and, and it didn't, uh, in, in terms of dementia, actually not, not, not only didn't uh, inc increase dementia, but protected dementia. So that's in the elderly. So, uh, so for the right patient, I think we should we should uh, consider uh, going more aggressive. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, do you want to, Ali to yeah. add something to that? No, no I think. Uh, oh, go ahead, Ali. Go ahead. No, no. I, I, I think that was the key point that I wanted to mention: the harm of orthostatic. But in the right patient, again, as we are consistent, it's appropriate to be more aggressive in the highly functional lack of orthostatic hypertension, elderly patients. Perfect. Um, uh, another question, thiazide diuretics are the commonest cause of hyponatremia and hypokalemia in the elderly. Has this been addressed in the guidelines? So I, this has been a concern, absolutely right. So we have addressed this in the guidelines. So the recommendations are before starting someone on a thiazide or a thiazide light diuretic, it is important to check their baseline sodium and once starting these agents, we also want to warn patients of the symptoms of hyponatremia, mainly CNS symptoms, um, and also to check their uh, electrolytes uh, periodically to watch for hypokalemia and hyponatremia. So that's the hyponatremia, and it's easily correctable. But again, we need to inform our patients. There are some studies looking at the severity of hyponatremia comparing thiazide within thiazide and thiazide diuretics. They're conflicting, but the bottom line is, is that the patients who ran into more trouble with hyponatremia and hypokalemia were the ones who were using very, very high doses of thiazide diuretics. For example, 50 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide, 50 milligram of chlorothaldone, uh, 5 milligram of indipamide. But if you stick to the <clears throat> doses that are recommended and follow them carefully, the risk of hypokalemia is not that high. And the risk of hypo hyponatremia is, if, if chosen in the right population, is not that high using the appropriate doses. So um, another question is, is there a strong guidelines recommendation when to screen people for mast hypertension? So this is a tough one. Uh, often we're finding, at least based on the data that we've looked at, is often mast hypertension is done because the patient comes into the doctor's office and it's more not, it's that they've actually checked their blood pressures at home and they mentioned to the doctor or the healthcare provider, it's so high at home, but why am I normal at, at, at the doctor's office? So we don't really have good data on when to screen because the, because the problem is, is if we do find mass hypertension, we don't know if we intervene, are we going to make a difference in outcomes, which, which biologically makes sense that we should be treating it more aggressively, but we just don't know. This is just a hypothesis. And hopefully in the next little while, we will get some more data. I know, I know a Kabira Dasgupta, Stella, you can correct me if I'm wrong. She was doing some studies on this in, in Montreal, and hopefully we'll get some data from there. The other way we're finding out- Not about, Kabira, but yes. We are yeah, sorry, Kabira. Yeah, and, uh, sorry, and, and, and the no. other, other place where we're getting, uh, finding mass hypertension is based on insurance companies. They're asking uh, patients to do their blood pressure at home for coverage for whatever, medications or whatnot. We're finding the cases of mass hypertension there. So that's, that's, that's the issue around uh, mass hypertension. And um, may I add to that? Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, the pharmacy also is a great source because people go uh, <coughs> open to the pharmacy, you know, like, and they have their blood pressure. So this is sometimes the first uh, alert that they get. But in general, we say there is no strong recommendation, but there is a recommendation um, to, to, uh, to screen people who are older, 
men, uh, smokers, uh, alcohol use or abuse actually, uh, obese people, diabetes, uh, pe people with diabetes or other traditional risk factors. And then we, we should suspect when we have LVH and uh, in general, uh, these people have high normal um, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure in the office. They will never have uh, optimal or low blood pressure, but they are in the high normal range. So in these cases, we, we should suspect and we should um, uh, probably ask them to do out, out of office or, or even get some measurements from the pharmacy if they don't have a machine themselves. Um, but it's true that we don't know the true prevalence because it's very hard to do studies like that, but uh, we, it's somewhere between 30 to 40 percent even. Yeah, hopefully we'll get more data on if we find this condition, do we, yeah. do we get outcome data? That's the key thing right now. Another thing I wanted to mention is, again, it's a good screen for health promotion also. Uh, I'm not saying everyone do it, but uh, if you have another compel compelling indication with mass hypertension, then it might help you maybe sway more towards therapeutic uh, implementation. For example, if they have diabetes or you find LVH incidentally, or they have any uh, proteinuria in their urine, then it becomes a little bit easier to intervene because you might get some benefit from, from uh, morbidity and mortality point of view. <clears throat> so uh, what is your preferred uh, diuretic for blood pressure treatment in patients uh, who are taking SSRIs that can cause low uh, sodium? Okay. So we all know that SSRIs are notorious uh, for, uh, for causing uh, hyponatremia. Again, it's the same thing. I think if any of us put anyone on SRI, and I do periodically, I'm not a psychiatrist, but uh, we do see patients on the CTU who are depressed, uh, overtly depressed, and we may start a safe SSRI or, a, or an SNRI, and we do check their baseline sodiums and <clears throat> counsel them on symptoms of hyponatremia and check their sodiums and follow up. So if someone has a normal sodium on an SSRI, <clears throat> and we've, they've been on it for a while, and they're quite with it and functional, I think I would suggest the same intervention, understanding there is no data, this is not an evidence-based recommendation, but this is a Preptani, not evidence-based recommendation, but it's just more practical uh, recommendation is, it's reasonable to start a thiazide, and again, the low doses, so either clothalidone or, or indipamide, preferably in a combination pill, so it makes adherence easier and better improvement in blood pressure control, but just monitor them clinically for hyponatremia, and periodic uh, sodium measurements. Yeah. Okay, so why does mass hypertension have a poorer outcome? What is the pathophysiological mechanism? That's really easy. I don't think we know. Um, again, <laughs> Stella, you can add to this. Hello? Gal, he just froze. We'll just give him a second to come back. Which is more than being at uh, the doctor's office. You're at the doctor's office maybe for 10 minutes, Sorry, 20 Ali. minutes. Sorry, In Ali. this day and age, zero minutes, but, uh, but you're at home so much. If you're under a lot of stress, it might cause chronic uh, uh, stimulation and chronic uh, RAS uh, stimulation, which might lead to poor. Sorry, Ali, you're frozen. We seem to have lost Ali there. So Dr. Daskopoulou, can you wanna just address that question? Yeah, I think he, he addressed it nicely, but uh, <laughs> but uh, he, we lost him completely or? Yeah, he's disappeared off the call, so he'll come back. Uh, okay, so, um, so we, yeah, we don't really know, but uh, we believe that uh, um, there might be a, a RAS um, activation uh, due to mass uh, hypertension. It's actually true hypertension in a sense that, that uh, you know, like people are not... Uh, they, Sorry, they I got cut off and I just got signed back on. Yeah, that's okay. Stella's just answering Hello? the question, Ali. So. Okay, no, no, you can, you can go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, you, you, you are, you're already answering the question, but we couldn't hear you. I, I can't. Sorry, I... Can you guys hear me? I just got cut off. Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm, ba I'm back on. Yeah, okay. so, okay. So why, Stella, why don't you move on to the next question? Do, do you want to answer this question? Because we didn't hear you. Sorry, what was the last, I just got, what was the last question? Um, why must <coughs> hypertension have a poorer outcome? What is the pathophysiological mechanism? We didn't hear your answer. Okay, I think I must have just got 
Okay, I think I must have just got cut off. So we really don't know. And I think until we get more data, we'll be able to answer that question better. But some of the speculations are, is that we spend very little time at the doctor's office when we get the office blood pressure measurement. But if we're at home, we're there most of the time at work, we're there most of the time. So the thinking is if we're under a chronic stress at home or at work, this might activate the sympathetic nervous system on a continual basis and also cause continual RAS uh, stimulation, leading to poor uh, outcomes, both from the cardiovascular and the renal point of view. So that, these are just speculations, but we just don't have the accurate scientific data yet now to say why patients with uh, mass hypertension do worse than uh, uh, true hypertension or white coat hypertension. Did you want to add anything to that, uh, Stella? No, that's, that's exactly what I started. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what we know. So the next question is, what is the risk of lacunar strokes and dementia with aggressive blood pressure control in the elderly? So we do have, again, as I mentioned in one of my first slides, the, the, reduction, the reduction of stroke is the most favorable outcome with aggressive blood pressure control. So what I mean by aggressive blood pressure control in the elderly is if they're not getting orthostatic hypertension, there are no contraindications, they have a relatively good quality of life and a duration of life, they're not super frail, we should probably achieve or aim for the same blood pressure targets as we do in the other adults. And I would say if they're not diabetic <coughs> and they're functional, <coughs> less than 140 over 90 in the office, in automated office or out of office, less than 135 over 85. If they're diabetic, you can make an argument <coughs> to reduce it even less than 130 over 80 cautiously. But again, remember in the diabetic patients, and then Sheldon Tobin and I have debated this also, most of the data for diabetes targets is for the diastolic blood pressure, which is a grade A recommendation of 80. The 130, we're sort of still wishy-washy. Should it be 130, should it be 135? But we made it simple and we left the systolic for diabetics to 130 for the meantime until we get more data. <clears throat> And in general, we know that uh, stroke is um, uh, the, the, the one, one category really to, uh, that we need to uh, increase, to decrease blood pressure is to prevent stroke. Uh, like in people who have high, high risk of stroke, the lower you go, the better. Like we, in these people with high risk, we could even practically, not according to the guidelines, but practically we go to 120 to reduce the risk of stroke because it has been shown over the 115 uh, uh, systolic blood pressure, you know, like the risk is linear. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah this, was, this was also, uh, I don't know if Dr. Gerstein's on the line, but, but this was also shown in Accord. There was a subset that showed that uh, stroke, there was a benefit in stroke. Uh, with a systolic of uh, 120, where other outcomes were uh, were not as beneficial, yeah. based on the cord study. And uh, and as we mentioned before, dementia is actually uh, not improved, but definitely not not uh, getting worse in the right spring patient, uh, elderly patient. So uh, so there well, there was a, a great uh, you know concern about that, but in fact it hasn't been shown to be uh, harmful. So do you believe that hypertension meds should be taken in the evening? Um, so that's a great question, uh, Stella. There was uh, a, a one study looking at uh, breaking up your uh, blood pressure medications, taking, uh, if you're on two medications, uh, taking uh, one in the morning and when it went at bedtime, it wasn't very strongly powered unless there's a new study that I'm unaware of, which showed that there was a better improvement in blood pressure control and maybe better uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Again, one study, uh, that did look at breaking up the pills. So the way I look at this is, is that what's the downside? Um, if adherence is not that an issue and you're on two pills and you've got to take two pills, there's probably uh, maybe an advantage of breaking up the pills, taking one in the morning and one at night with a possible benefit and no real harm. Uh, that, was, that would be the way that I would answer uh, that question. Yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, as, uh, as Ali mentioned, uh, there, there's actually a group, they have several studies, but it all comes from one group in Spain, the Hermida group, and they have shown that um, uh, taking the medication in the evening, the chrono uh, biology, basically, of, of hypertension, and, uh, and they, they looked at, uh, at that, and they, they look, they're looking at 24-hour, 48-hour uh, APPMs, uh, they have found that actually uh, you have much better control, blood pressure control, and eventually outcomes. Um, however, no other group has uh, has actually 
replicated this study and um, so based on this group it's it seems it seems actually reasonable to look at your abpm so if you see that you take the blood medication in the morning and then you know like you wake up in the with using abpm and and during the night or the next morning your blood pressure is high it makes sense to spread the medications also depends on what medications you are using for example perindopril has a better coverage 24 hour coverage for from the ace inhibitors other medications have lower so it depends on uh, ramipril actually it's, it doesn't so it should be given uh, twice a day so uh, so you have to, to to depends on what medication you're using but definitely if you're suspecting that you don't have 24 hour coverage abpm should be a good answer to that and then you go accordingly and many people don't have access to 24 hour abpm so this is where the home blood pressure monitoring is also useful exactly and exactly. uh, with an with a validated device, and that can help you guide of how often you should take your medication and when and so on. And I often tell my patients to actually do this as a guide to splitting up or not splitting up uh, their BP meds. Yeah, perfect. So uh, another question is: uh, I often get older patients that have isolated systolic hypertension and say that they have had that for years. Some physicians are more tolerant to it. What are the recommendations for these patients? So the recommendations are the same again in the non frail, with a good functional status, high risk of stroke, uh, they're going to live reasonably well. Uh, we would still target the systolic blood pressure to the same targets as we would if someone has uh, other uh, blood pressure parameters. So I think it'd be the same uh, as long as the risk of, you watch the risk of orthostatic hypertension. And again, on ortho, as, as people do get older, their arteries do become more stiff and there is a risk of volume contraction. So we have to be, again, once more careful for orthostatic hypertension. But the recommendations are the same for the for the elderly with isolated uh, systolic hypertension or ish, but the, the targets are the same for the most part. Yeah. Um, so can you comment on uh, screening patients with hypertension, obesity, and diagnosed OSA for primary hyperaldosteronism? Okay, so we actually, as you know, Stella, we battled this during the last uh, guideline review. <laughs> um, the Endocrine Society uh, recommends that patients who have hypertension and sleep apnea should be screened for hyperaldosteronism, but we did an extensive literature review, and we, find, we found the data was quite weak. Uh, there was a bit of an association, but we weren't strongly convinced based on the evidence that everyone with sleep apnea and hypertension should be screened for aldosterone, hyperaldosteronism. And this is another reason, hypokalemia, easily provoked hypokalemia, refractory, adrenal mass detected incidentally. So currently, based on the evidence, and as you know that we have a lot of rigorous methodology in the hypertension kind of guidelines, is if someone has hypertension with no other compelling indications to screen for hyperaldo, if they have sleep apnea, we are not routinely recommending screening for obstructive, we're not recommending, we routinely recommending screening for hyperaldosterone in these patients as of yet. But we'll wait for more data, but again, you will notice that the Endocrine Society does recommend this, but again, we based it on a lot more evidence and we are not at this time. Okay, so blood pressure is required to drive blood to all organ systems uh, relative to their medical uh, de uh, metabolic demand. Uh, what do we do to monitor that blood pressure is adequate to meet these needs? So again, um, I'm old school in that sense. Uh, I think we should go back to basic principles and look at symptoms. Uh, you know, there's a saying that uh, for LV dysfunction, uh, we should target our proven therapies till patients don't fall. Again, that's a little bit extreme. I'm not going to say that, but look for symptoms. You know, if they're feeling dizzy, then we back off. We have to listen to our patients, right? It's really easy to follow trials, but remember those trials are highly selected and they're getting phone calls from nurses and uh, dietitians and doctors and study investigators. But if someone has com side effect complaints, so whether it's dizziness or headache, I think we have to really listen to our patients and watch those uh, symptoms to target our blood pressure. If someone has having significantly cold feet, we got to think about claudication and maybe you're using the wrong blood pressure medication. So again, the point here is, is looking at symptoms to see if they're getting perfusion, um, especially dizziness and other symptoms of uh, uh, hypoperfusion. And I'm strongly advocating for patients who are having symptoms or the elderly to monitor their orthostatic vitals uh, to make sure they're, 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 they're perfusing okay and they're not running into troubles. So for patients with this resistant hypertension, as they undergo screening for secondary hypertension, what is your regimen for the fourth or the fifth antihypertensive medication of choice? So as long as you've done the caveat of, okay, you've, you've done the blood pressure properly, it truly is refractory. They're on more than or equal to three drugs. They're not meeting targets. The technique is good. 
you ruled out interfering factors such as the cuff size and so on, and they're not drinking significant amounts of alcohol, there you ruled out birth control pill, herbal supplements, NSAIDs, 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 it's really refractory, and they're on the appropriate therapies, that includes a thiazide or a thiazide-like diuretic, plus or minus a calcium channel blocker dihydropyridine and a RAS blocking agent, and they're still uncontrolled, and that I would say that is refractory. Then I would say have a low threshold once you ruled out secondary causes, if appropriate, to add on probably the first line, fourth line, fourth line agent would be spironolactone. And the reason why is based on the pathway study. So spironolactone is, is evidence-based. It has a significant reduction in blood pressure and it is pennies. It is pennies. Spironolactone is very, very cheap, at least in Ontario. I'm not sure of the cost in Quebec and outside of uh, Ontario, but I figure it is probably the same because it's, it's in Canada. So it's very cheap. And then if they're refractory to spironolactone, if they have side effects or if they have contraindications, then we can go on to other agents, which are fourth line such as the uh, alpha-1 blocker. In particular, I use a lot of doxazosin because it's longer acting. Uh, clonidine, use cautiously, which is a central uh, alpha agonist or even uh, uh, selective uh, beta blocker, such as uh, zoprol, which is quite long acting. Okay, so far any difference in treatment regimen for mast versus essential hypertension as mechanism might be different? No, I don't know. We don't, I don't think anyone knows, right, Stella? We've talked about that uh, yeah. several times today. So. I know we're getting a lot of questions on mass hypertension and I'm humbled by how little we know about mass hypertension. And hopefully the next time I do this in the next round of guidelines, uh, we'll have a lot more information on uh, mass hypertension. Maybe we should have a separate chapter, Stella, on mass yeah, hypertension. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's been in the works uh, for a um, couple of years now, but yeah, that's our next uh, target. <laughs> okay, does it matter what drugs one uses, side effects apart, as long as blood pressure is controlled? Yes, that's a great question. So. Generally speaking, uh, for if someone has no other, the key fat question to ask is, does the patient have compelling indications? If there are no compelling indications, then we would follow the general approach. Either pick from ACE or ARB, thiazide-like diuretic, or dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Pretty simple. Either in solo, if their blood pressure is not too far from target, or in a, a single pill combination therapy, if their target is significantly above uh, what, what it should be. But if they have, we have to really look at compelling indications because then we can get, we can kill, I shouldn't say kill two birds with a stone. We can, we can benefit two reasons for using that therapy. So if someone has LV dysfunction, there should be a low threshold for incorporating to the regimen a beta blocker, it's the ACE or an ARB, plus or minus a mineral or corticoid receptor antagonist such as spironolactone or plenarone. If they have uh, diabetic nephropathy, again, a low threshold for using an ACE or an ARB. So we really have to look at compelling indications in terms of looking at what therapy is the best for that patient based on randomized control trials and outcome data. So not, it's not only about blood pressure, but it's also about compelling indications to serve our patients in the right way for maximal benefit and outcomes. Perfect. So the next one is, uh, is uh, it's rather a suggestion that uh, we should be careful basically um, with uh, too low systolic blood pressure in frail elderly and um, the spring mind had only less than 30%, um, uh, less than 75 year old people, and uh, did not reduce the menstrual rate, as we said, but less MCI. Uh, and uh, the person who said that, uh, said that I tend to aim for 130 or so in frail for what that's worth it. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. No, so I agree. I, yes, we have to be careful in elderly. Again, as I mentioned, orthostatic hypertension, but in the highly functional elderly who meets the SPRINT criteria, as long as we're monitoring for orthostasis, we can probably try to achieve the same targets if it's done properly out of office or ambulatory, automated office blood pressure monitoring. Um, one thing I did want, I'm glad you mentioned the systolic, but there is data to show that in patients who di dropping diastolic blood pressure is very important not to be too aggressive, especially in those patients with active CAD. And we know that most of the activity or the ATP activity or the, or the metabolic activity and cardiac function occurs in diastole. So if we drop the diastolic blood pressure too low, especially less than 60 in active CAD patients, we may cause harm. So we gotta be very careful with diastolic blood pressure in active coronary artery disease patients, especially who have ongoing angina. Yeah, that's a great we, we should probably, guys, it's, it's nine o'clock, so we probably should just uh, draw it to a close there just because people have other meetings to get to. So just, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pratani and Dr. Daskopoulou for uh, being present today and uh, uh, the Canadian Hypertension Society for co-hosting these. Ali, a great set of rounds, very clear, lots of great information. 
Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure you'll get additional questions through the chat function and uh, personally through emails, including one I just sent you. So thanks everybody for attending. We look forward to next week. The next two weeks I think are going to be COVID related. So more COVID heading your way. Uh, but uh, you'll see more details from my office starting in a uh, starting next week. And Dr. Daskopoulou, please uh, again take accept my thanks on behalf of the department for being with us today and co-presenting rounds. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye now. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.